An official census of Boston, Massachusetts would say that the majority of the population identify as Irish Catholic, but it's clear to anyone that the citizens of Boston are devout Red Sox fans. Boston's faithful are known throughout the league, for better or for worse, for supporting their team to an intensity that is unmatched by any other fan base in baseball. Their place of worship, Fenway Park, is the most iconic stadium in baseball and possibly all of sports. When I first traveled to Boston to see a Red Sox game, it felt like I was making a pilgrimage to the Holy Land where baseball gods like Ted Williams and Pedro Martinez had played. Just like most churches, Fenway and the Red Sox have been there for the citizens of Boston in times of crisis. On April 15th, 2013, two bombs went off at the finish line of the Boston Marathon, killing three and injuring hundreds. A vicious attack on citizens of this scale hadn't been seen in Boston since the Boston Massacre, and it shook the morale of the city and the rest of the United States. An outpouring of support came in from across the league. Even their bitter rivals, the New York Yankees, played Fenway's eighth inning anthem, Sweet Caroline, as tribute. That season, expectations were low for the Red Sox. The Red Sox hadn't finished that low in the standing since 1992 and it felt like the bombings were just another sign that hope was little to be found in Boston. Living up to its reputation as a fighting town, the city showed it wouldn't go down without a fight. The real moment when Boston's outlook turned around is when DH and Red Sox legend David Ortiz addressed the crowd before their next right, home Boston. game. His speech was short and simple, but put into words what most people were feeling and was the rallying cry that Boston needed. This jersey that we wear today, it doesn't say Red Sox, it say Boston. In a career where he finished with the 17th most home runs of all time, was a 10-time All-Star, and led the Red Sox to three World Series, including the curse-breaking 2004 team, this speech is arguably his most important moment in a Boston uniform. The rest of the team would step up and follow suit. Finishing the regular season with a 97 and 65 record and winning first place in their division, the Red Sox perfectly embodied the Boston Strong slogan that was on the lips of Bostonians and the rest of the US. Equipped with beards galore, they would carry that momentum into the playoffs, fighting through tough series against the Tigers and the Cardinals to win the World Series becoming only the second team to do so after finishing in last place the previous year. The victory parade would follow some of the same route as the Boston Marathon and would end at the finish line where the bombings took place. As the team crossed the line, they placed the commissioner's trophy on the finish line with a Boston Strong jersey, following through on the words of Big Poppy. This is our city. And nobody gonna dictate our freedom. Stay strong. Thank you. Along with their perseverance in the face of tragedies, one thing Boston is incredibly proud of is their lobster rolls. Finishing second in this year's MLB food fight, this tangy lobster salad inside a New England hot dog bun is an absolute icon and are devoured in droves by locals year round. They love them so much that they don't even seem to mind that Fenway's lobster rolls are made by the Yankee Lobster Company. Starting with the signature split top bun, in a bowl, pour in half a cup of warm water, mix in two teaspoons of active dry yeast and one tablespoon of sugar. While that's blooming, measure out 500 grams of all-purpose flour, the thing that gives these buns their fluffy texture and rich flavor is milk powder. So we'll add one quarter cup of that, two tablespoons of sugar, one and a half teaspoons of salt, and whisk it all together. Crack one egg into your yeast bowl and add in half a cup of warm milk and mix that all together. Combine all the contents of your yeast bowl into the flour bowl and try not to drop it in. 
Bring it all together until it forms a dough and knead in four tablespoons of softened butter a little bit at a time. Turn your dough out onto a lightly floured work surface and make sure to pat it for good luck. Knead until your dough is nicely smooth and stretchy and shape it into a nice taut ball. Place it in a greased up bowl, cover and let it rise for an hour until doubled in size. While your dough is rising, it's time to cook our lobster. At the time of filming this, I had never cooked lobster before, so you get to learn how along with me. Prep a large pot of salted water boiling on the stove. Add in about one tablespoon of salt for every quart of water. Now, lobster meat decays quite quickly, so cooking fresh live lobster tastes significantly better than frozen. Since I'm really not looking forward to killing a live animal, the least I can do is kill it as humanely as possible. To start with, put your lobster in the freezer for a bit to calm them down. Right, Once you've done that, you're the right. easiest way to pick up the lobster is by the body. Once you're ready to go, place the tip of a sharp knife on the lobster's head joint and press down and forward quickly to kill the lobster. I didn't leave the lobster in the freezer long enough here, so our lobster understandably wasn't happy about a knife in its head and flailed around quite a bit. As you can probably tell, I really didn't enjoy that part. Why are you still moving? Once your lobster stops moving, immediately place it into the pot of water and boil it for 8 to 12 minutes depending on the size of your lobster until it's bright red. Remove the lobster from the pot with tongs and let it cool off. To break down your lobster, start by grabbing the body and the tail and cracking them with your hands to remove. Twist the arms from the body until they separate. Do the same thing with the lobster's legs. To crack the tail, grip it with both hands and pull apart to crack the shell and separate the tail meat. As you can see, I didn't make the best crack initially, which made it harder to remove the meat. Twist and crack to remove the knuckle from the claw. To remove the meat from each claw, make an indent in the top of the claw with the back of the chef's knife and twist to break the claw apart, doing the same on the opposite side. Once the claw is broken, carefully remove the meat from each claw. On each leg, separate each joint and use a rolling pin to squeeze out the meat from the leg. To remove the meat from the knuckle, cut along the length of the knuckle with kitchen scissors to remove the meat. I made the mistake here of not separating the knuckles into individual joints, which makes breaking them down easier. Finally, there isn't very much meat in the body and the head, just tomoli. If you like the taste of it, you can put in the work to separate that from the head, but most lobster rolls don't include it, so it isn't strictly necessary. With your lobster meat all separated into one bowl, add mayo until it just covers all of the lobster. For me, that was about two tablespoons. Add in about half a stalk of minced celery and the zest of one lemon. Finish it off with a squeeze of fresh lemon juice, salt and pepper to taste, and our lobster filling is good to go. Checking back on our buns, once risen, punch the dough down and divide it into 10 equal pieces by weight. Not every bread recipe needs to be precisely divided by weight, but because these buns need to rise into each other, this is one time I recommend putting in the extra effort. Flatten each piece of dough into a rectangle with your fingers and then tightly roll into a log, pinching the seams to seal it up. Place these onto a floured baking tray about half an inch apart so that they'll rise into each other. There are trays that are specifically made for New England hot dog buns, which will get you a really nice shape, but they're not strictly necessary. Brush the top of your buns with egg wash, cover your tray with a kitchen towel, and let it rise for another half hour. Bake the buns at 350 degrees for 15 to 20 minutes until nice and golden brown. Wait until they've cooled and pull apart a bun, taking a moment to admire just how perfectly fluffy they got. Cover the sides of your bun with butter and then give it a nice toast in a pan. Cut an opening along the top of the bun 
and remind yourself that you need a better bread knife. Fill the bun to bursting with your lobster salad and dig in. These turned out really well. The buns are some of the best I've ever made and the taste of fresh lobster really shines. Take a bite of that delicious lobster roll and enjoy the game. Shot to right, slicing toward the pesky pole.